hey, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I just want to thank the, all the people in this ceremonial office, as well as uh, others around the building who are working hard and couldn't be here, uh, for their support of our efforts to put together a coalition that's going to pass our path to prosperity, uh, my singular goal this session, uh, to ensure that we grow jobs and grow prosperity for Vermonters by having the best education system in the country, from early child education to higher education to workforce retraining. As you know, the K through jobs plan for education in Vermont uh, has a number of pieces, all of which are intertwined and important. We're asking our state to cooperate with us to take the money that we're spending right now in education, one of the best education systems in the country, and make it even better. Not by spending more money, but by thinking creatively about how we can get better results, move more kids from poverty beyond high school, and ensure that we provide our employers who are hungry for workers with science, math, engineering, and technology skills the workforce that they need so that we can prosper in the 21st century. I'm joined today by an extraordinary coalition of people who actually do the hard work. And I just want to mention them briefly. Uh, we have with us, uh, you'll hear shortly, uh, from Martha Allen, president of the National Education Asso Association of Vermont. Uh, with us also, and speaking, Martha will be speaking for Steve Dale, Vermont School Boards Association for the Association. Ken Page is here with the Vermont Principals Association. Jeff Francis, the Vermont Superintendents Association. These are all folks that I've met with uh, privately over the last uh, several weeks uh, to forge and help make sure this package uh, becomes a reality. To Lisa Ventress, the Vermont Business Roundtable, who's very enthusiastic about our proposal. Thank you for being here. Betsy Bishop from the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Invaluable to have business partnering with us to get this job done. We have our chairs of the Education Committee, Senator Dick McCormick and Representative Joey Donovan. I didn't see Joey, but I know she's here. Come on over, Joey. Don't hide in the corner. It's not like Well. Wow. Uh, uh, President Joyce Judy, CCV, incredibly important partner in this effort. We have Scott Gillies here from Vermont Student Assistance Corporation. Without VSAC, we wouldn't be doing our job. Susan Stiley, you'll hear from shortly, Vermont Independent Colleges. My partner, Secretary Armando Villaseca, and my partner, Secretary Lawrence Miller, our job secretary. Annie Noonan couldn't make it, but I know the commissioner wishes she could be here. She's an integral part of this. And of course, the speaker and the president pro tem, thank you for your support. What's the plan? The plan is to ensure that our flexible pathways from early childhood education through workforce retraining ensure that we have an education system that is tailored to each student's learning style and each student's needs. As you know, we've proposed a number of initiatives that will help make that happen. The, first, the, the single greatest investment in early childhood education in the history of Vermont, $17 million. Ensuring that we have in elementary school the flexibility and the plan for each student to ensure that they get beyond high school and succeed regardless of income. Uh, ensuring that we have dual enrollment and early college, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And the investments that we're making in higher education to both buy back any tuition increases at UVM and the state colleges for next year's tuition, but most importantly to ensure that we are offering incentives for STEM graduates to stay in Vermont by paying their entire <coughs> last year of college tuition if they stay and work in this state, or their last semester if you're accomplishing an associate's degree. I want to talk a little about the proposal right now that we've been working on over the last few days that this coalition has been so supportive of to deliver on our promise of dual enrollment and early college. We have worked out an agreement with all the parties that will speak shortly to be able to make dual enrollment work, and we know it failed last year and failed in some past years because the coalition wasn't all singing from the same hymnal. But we are now. And what 
because of our extraordinary partners in higher education in this state, both public and private, working together with our high school, the folks who are delivering uh, high school, public ed, high school education in this state, we have come up with a system where any high school student will be able to take a college credit course in their high school for $150. Second, that any high school student in Vermont will be able to take a college course at one of our many campuses, state colleges, UVM, or any private institution that cares to participate for $350 a student. This will be financed through an $800,000 appropriation over two years from the general fund combined with a money following the student based upon a $400,000 local pay. We think this is a great opportunity to be able to take students who currently aren't getting beyond high school or who are having trouble affording college, which is our biggest challenge right now facing Vermont's college-bound students, and give them the opportunity to get up to a year of college credit while they're in high school. Now that's a huge development. When we look at what we're spending per pupil, about $15,500 on average, our challenge is not to figure out ways to spend more money. Our challenge is to figure out ways to take the money that we're spending and get a bigger bang for the buck. I'm incredibly grateful to those here for uh, supporting this piece of our flexible pathways to ensure that we're competitive and growing prosperity. I want to thank our partners for coming up with this bold proposal. And I want to start by turning it over to uh, Tim Donovan, the Chancellor of the State Colleges, to say a word about their involvement. Thank, thank you, you, Governor. Governor. Over the course of the last decade, uh, the State Colleges have been growing the opportunities for dual enrollment high schools, high school students taking college courses that count both for high school graduation and, towards, and, and, and college credit. And we've seen the extraordinary impact that has, not just on the kids who are already planning to go to college, but the, for those who are wavering um, and envisioning themselves feeling success in a, in a different environment. Uh, I, I'm thrilled that, that uh, the governor has proposed and we've been able to put a framework around this concept that's going to expand it uh, to more students and give them more opportunities uh, to start college before the end high school. Um, and uh, the, the folks that we've worked with on this have made this possible. Um, I think uh, we will look back on this date a couple years from now and see that it's made an incredible difference on college aspirations uh, and, and our young people understanding that something after high school is essential uh, to compete in this economy. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you, Chancellor. And I want to give you a special shout out uh, as well as to President Joyce Judy at CCV uh, for helping us to get through these last few days of discussions uh, in such a productive way. Uh, it's a real honor to also introduce at this time uh, the President of UVM, Tom Sullivan. Listen, uh, the President hasn't been on this job long, and what he has proven is that he's pragmatic, he's extraordinarily able to bring people together to get things done, and he understands that tuition increases in higher education as does the chancellor, are cutting out, shutting out Vermonters uh, who wish to get beyond high school but can't afford to. I'm proud of the fact that in his first year, he's come up with the most reasonable tuition increase in many, many years at UVM, 3%. As you know, we have allocated uh, the money available, the, the money necessary, first increase in higher education in five years in my budget, uh, to buy back that 3%. So any Vermonter can go to UVM next year without any increase over the prior year. That's the first time in a long time. He's helping us out with so, me so much of this package. Thank you so much, President Sullivan. Good to have you here. Thank you, Governor. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the University of Vermont. And I want to salute you on this remarkable uh, concept. It's inspiring, it's strong, and the vision that is what you're announcing today, this early uh, education, college education opportunity, builds on a platform that the citizens and the leaders of this state have already begun. This proposal today will take that forward and advance that concept. And importantly, as the governor just said, it will do two very important things. It will make higher education more affordable for Vermont students at a very early age. 
it will knock down those financial barriers for access to success for our students in our Vermont colleges and universities. And importantly, it will advance and encourage students to graduate on time, which of course has a financial as well as an uh, academic impact. So we applaud the vision and the concept and we're pleased to be a partner at the university with the political leadership of the state and the governor today as we help students get through college successfully and with less financial burden. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate it. I now just want to give a minute uh, to our independent colleges, Susan Steitley, to say a word. Uh, you know, there's no better example, or maybe there are better examples, but I want to cite one that's mighty good uh, down in my home county of Wyndham County, where Marlboro College right now is cooperating with Brattleboro Union High School, Tom Yon and, um, and our superintendent, uh, to ensure that they are offering college-level courses in our high schools right now uh, for roughly $100 a kid. It's a big deal. So we want our extraordinary array of quality higher education organizations that are independent in Vermont, private, to join in this effort. And Susan, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. Welcome. <coughs> I thank the governor for recognizing the importance of education to the future of Vermont. The Association of Vermont Independent Colleges is pleased to have contributed to this effort. Uh, as the governor mentioned, many private colleges are engaged in providing opportunities to increase access and aspiration for Vermont high school students. Dual enrollment programs benefit a wide a range of students. One group that is currently benefiting from the dual enrollment program are New Americans in Burlington. I want to just give a brief example. Burlington College is teaching an ESL writing uh, for college students, uh, for college class at Burlington High School for seniors. Six different languages are spoken in the class. These uh, new American families have chosen Vermont as their home, and it's most likely that these students will continue to stay in Vermont and contribute their talents to the state. These courses open up a new pathway uh, for these students. Uh, the governor mentioned Marlboro College's initiative. SIT is also offering uh, classes at the high school in Wyndham County. NECI is training students, high school students in culinary arts. These are just a few examples of um, what the private colleges are doing around dual enrollment, and we're really pleased that the governor's initiative is going to increase such opportunities. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for all your help. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, our partners at the National so Education Association, Vermont School Board Association, Principals Association, as well as our Vermont superintendents have been tremendously helpful to us uh, over these last weeks in, in putting together a plan that we think should pass. And I want to uh, give Martha Allen, the president of the National Education Association, a word to say, a minute to say a word. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, this is a very exciting day for us, uh, the K-12 community. And I just want to mention when the governor first was elected, we were talking about education. And I said, you know, governor, we've got one of the best education systems in the country. And he said to me, why can't we be the best? And I think that, uh, of course. <laughs> and so I think this is a really great step in the right direction to do that. Uh, the K-12 system is an incredible system as it is, and this is uh, going to allow us to branch into uh, higher ed and with pre-K work, it's going to be a wonderful system working together. Uh, I do hope that with this work, our state, our, the citizens in our state will really value our education system so that our culture changes and our students will understand and uh, aspire to um, higher ed, to further their education in whatever way they see fit. And having these opportunities for students who might not have had these opportunities in the past is fantastic. So uh, we'll be working in the K-12 piece and uh, doing what we can to assist our students to work their way into higher ed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martha. Uh, I also just want to give Lisa Ventress from Vermont Business Roundtable uh, an opportunity to say a word on behalf of the business, business community. Uh, this can't happen. We can't achieve, achieve prosperity and the best education system, as Martha just mentioned, taking the, the almost best and making it the best. Uh, without the participation and full partnership of the business community. There are two places that I know they can help us right now. The first is in ensuring that in our Flexible Pathways plan, uh, we have internships and apprenticeships and are 
integrating with businesses so that students can get a better understanding of what their education will mean if they pursue certain courses in order to achieve professional goals. The levels of income students can make based upon the choices they make in school. Linking more carefully the choices we make as kids and young students and young college students with the results later on in life. Second, Lisa and the Business Roundtable have been absolute uh, leaders on getting the message out to policymakers that the dollars we invest in early childhood education uh, make a huge difference to moving kids in poverty beyond high school, to ensuring that everybody has an opportunity for prosperity in Vermont, and understanding that when we spend a dollar on early childhood education, we save six or seven dollars later on. So Lisa, thanks for your great work. We're glad you're here. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Um, on behalf of the roundtable, I'm happy to be a part of this uh, session today. And I would just like, again, to extend appreciation to all the different uh, players here. Um, we, in the roundtable, um, have a very simple mantra when it comes to education. And we say, education equals opportunity. And we talk about uh, economic development strategies really beginning with investments in our education system because that is what is going to help our youngest Vermonters get the very best start in life and then help them be ready for their formal K through 12 education. The governor's vision and his leadership on this issue is tremendously appreciated. Um, this is, we believe, the state's number one economic development strategy. It will help our citizens prepare for their life beyond secondary school, whether that's in higher uh, education or directly into the workforce. Uh, we also know, however, that to be successful in life today, you need more than a high school degree. You need some kind of post-secondary preparation. So all of the work that's going uh, behind the flexible pathways will help those students be successful later on. We are delighted to be a part of it. Um, we will continue those conversations and um, we're very happy to help uh, Governor Shumlin, whom we call our education governor. So thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks to all the other folks that are here. We'd be happy, any of us, all of us, to answer any questions you might have uh, if you have them. Why is it the one thing that you're saying we need, or I'm sure there's other things you're saying we need, but is, is more college classes when at the same time we're not even requiring at the high school level to take geometry or well let me be clear I'm talking about the entire package I'm talking about our K through jobs proposal being adopted uh, in, in its entirety and as I mentioned earlier if you pull one leg out from under the plan I advocate that the whole thing falls apart so today we're talking about early child uh, early college we're talking about dual enrollment and and uh, early college for the simple reason that we put together a coalition of folks who, where we had some difficulty in past years uh, coming to agreement on how it would work, we've got a plan that we think can work. But we don't want to de-emphasize any piece of this. If we're going to move more kids from poverty to prosperity, we've got to do better in our entire delivery system. That's why I proposed the biggest increase in early child education in the history of the state of Vermont. Why make uh, local governments pay for this after two years? Isn't that going to be a huge train? Them. Well, uh, let, let's be clear. We're putting together a funding proposal here that would have an impact lo on local communities of about $400,000 in a system that is currently spending over a billion dollars. So you can do the math. But we do not believe that any of our proposals put any significant pressure on local communities asking them to spend more. We believe that our proposal says Let's take the dollars we're spending now and spend them even better by having this money follow the student for these investments. But if this is a state government proposal, why not? Why shouldn't the state continue to fund it after this years? Well, you know, the, what we're saying is that uh, we're going to share that for the first two years, then we'll see where we go. Let's have success. We're hoping that we'll get at least 10% of Vermont students uh, taking college courses while they're in high school. I don't think there's too many Vermonters that are going to say, hey, that's not a smart way to spend money. Now, I reemphasize, we're talking about spending the money we're already spending in a smarter way. 
question for probably for you and for Ms. Venters. Um, Ventrist. Oh, you're, you're hardly ever wrong. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, wrong, I'm wrong regularly. It helps clear the pipes. Um, uh, you've, you know, uh, steadfastly held the line on broad based tax increases. Uh, I'm wondering if, I mean, that's obviously a principle on your part, but is it also part of what allows you to draw the business community into supporting this package? You know, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I probably speak to more Vermonters than most Vermonters. I spend my days on the road listening, and I learn a lot from listening. And I know that when you get in the bubble of this building, you might not believe this is true. But I have yet to have a Vermonter come up to me and say, Governor, you know, I think our biggest problem is that our taxes are not high enough in Vermont. Can you go out and raise them? The fact of the matter is, we have a very thoughtful tax policy in Vermont, the most thoughtful in the country. We ask our wealthiest residents to pay the most. We ask our poorest residents to pay the least. We all pay, and we pay plenty. And it's not just education on all the policy issues that we're facing. My view is, and I think the majority of Vermonters agree with me, don't raise taxes. Take the money that we're spending it and spend it in a smarter way so we get a bigger bang for our buck. Make government smarter, more efficient. We can do that. We don't need to ask Vermonters who are working hard right now to keep their heads above water out of the worst recession in American history to pay more taxes. Lisa, do you want to take that? Governor, we wanted to add one level of detail to Allie, the funding Allie, structure. Allie Richards does all the work here. I just <laughs> front person. Paul, uh, to your question, it's 800000 from the state during this two-year transition period each year from the general fund, and then beyond that is the cost sharing. When it transitions 50% to the local budgets, but 50%, we continue to make that cost share from the general fund. Do you get that? Yeah. Sorry. Lisa, do you want to answer that? I don't care if you do want to. Um, what I would, what I would um, just offer is that um, the business community for too long has been saying uh, we don't have the workforce that we need. Um, so in order for us to have the dynamic economy that um, exists in some parts of the state, in order for us to have that statewide, what um, we're interested in doing is taking those public dollars, and to the governor's point, redirecting them to where we know we're going to get very strong outcomes. So it's about uh, looking at what our capacity is and figuring out where the very best uh, investment can be made and, and um, working um, in groups like this to get uh, support and buy-in for it. So if, say, there's some talk in the legislature of finding a different funding source for the early education, which I know isn't the subject today, but um, if the legislature starts looking at other tax measures rather than the earned income tax credit, uh, is that something the, the business community would look to scan at? Well, we certainly would be involved in the conversation. Uh, Economics 101 says if a business can't find enough workers, it should, rate, it should pay more. Is, is that <coughs> accurate? Um, I think the... Um, Equally important strategy is to figure out how to build the workforce that you need. If you if you are trying to recruit and retain people, um, then uh, investing in their ongoing education and retraining is is one area. Or working um, to identify other partners that can help you develop that workforce. So it's readiness. It's getting those students to complete their education so that they can become um, good qualified students to continue in some kind of post-secondary um, education. What type of jobs okay. you know, are you trying to get people into through this program? Are there any particular areas? Um, it's, it's really um, across the board, but what we're hearing most consistently is that it's science, and technology and engineering and math. So it's, um, and some people use the acronym STEAM, um, but nevertheless, it's preparing students to be successful in a very um, technical uh, workforce that can compete globally and be working out of Vermont um, um, on a global platform. It seems to be focused on building the workforce kind of internally <coughs> or indigenously 
but we just saw uh, the Vermont's uh, population, which has been bumping along at about zero growth for several years, is now in the negative for the first time in uh, a long time. Mm -hmm. Do we need to be doing a better job recruiting people from out of state to move here to take some of these jobs, or? Uh, uh, well, how many happen? students are do we have in colleges in Vermont? Right. I think the estimate is about fifty thousand students at any one time in college in Vermont. So we are importing a lot of them um, every year. So here we have this great um, higher education um, community. Um, and those are potential workers um, that we need within the business community to have relationships with and, and help them recognize there's a place for them to work after they graduate. Can I just give you a one-liner on that? Because yeah. Lisa did a great job of explaining it, but you know, it's this simple. The biggest challenge to prosperity in Vermont is having enough trained workers in science, math, technology, and engineering to do the jobs that are out there. The second biggest challenge is the simple fact that we're not moving enough kids from poverty beyond high school. And all of these jobs require training beyond high school. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what you've got to do. You've got to take the dollars that you're spending now, spend them better by getting better outcomes in terms of what we're doing already. Let me go back to Economics 101, which tells us again that the biggest challenge to prosperity is usually not enough demand for goods and services. If we had enough demand for goods and services, if these, and if some, again, if, if some of the companies paid higher wages and salaries, they would get the workers, and if we had more demand. But you're missing the point, my friend. Listen, if you can't do basic math, if you can't run a computer, if you don't have the training to run the equipment or to do the jobs, it doesn't matter how much they pay you, you can't get the job done. But there are people out of Vermont have those skills who would come well, well, you actually, if you talk to the other 49 governors, they'll tell you that they're dealing with a similar challenge, but their climb is even higher because their schools aren't as good as ours. So all we got to do in Vermont is take a great system and make it even greater. The other challenge for the other states that are spending less money and doing a less good job is they got a much steeper hill to climb. Vermont's not alone in this challenge. When I go out to talk to folks in California, the folks that are running Google and Facebook and the rest, and you ask them what's your biggest challenge, they say it's this, finding enough trained workers to do the work we have, to have the science, math, technology, engineering, STEAM skills to do the job. So if we simply believe that by graduating students who don't have the skills to do the job, if we just pay them more, everything will be beautiful, I think you're missing the point. If you can't do basic math, you're not going to be able to do the job regardless of how much we pay the employee. Governor. Um I, uh, I definitely would concede you talk to more real Vermonters on a given day than I do, um, but within this building, um, I haven't heard a single legislator, um, certainly not a legislative leader, say they support your plan to pay for this program, which they say they like, uh, but to pay for it the way that you suggest, which is to reduce the state match to the earned income tax credit. Um, does that have any legs at all, and if so, who's on your side as far as the funding source? Well, you know, it's early in the session. This is what I can tell you. Uh, I firmly believe that my plan to move Vermonters from poverty to prosperity is absolutely dependent upon finding a smarter way to spend the earned income tax credit dollars that we're already spending and get rid of the cliff that forces people on welfare to stay in welfare and the insidious, cruel system that tells mostly single moms when they go get a job that if you take the job or you take a dollar raise, we take your benefits from you to the degree where you've got to go back on welfare. Now, I'm sorry, but I don't think that's compassionate. On Valentine's Day, that does not speak to my heart. And I don't think it speaks to many Vermonters' hearts. So as this process goes through, there's something to dislike about every proposal that every governor comes up with. But when they start to try find the $17 million to move kids out of prosperity, when they start looking at the wisdom of changing a welfare system that has benefits for life to one that rewards you when you get a job and gets, lets you share prosperity as you start to get raises, I think that folks in this building by the end of this session will understand that my plan makes sense. Is there anyone right now, any legislative leaders? Well, you know, I'm not going to play that game, because then you're going to run to them and say, you know, and we're not going here. My job is not to worry about how many legislators are with me now. My job is to worry about how I get the bill to my desk to sign. I will get it there. So 
So what about the, the report that your administration put out last year that, uh, that the reach up program shouldn't have a lifetime cap? Because under the current system, that report is absolutely right. It shouldn't. It would be cruel. It would be cruel to take away lifetime benefits under the current system when if you go get a job, you make less money than if you stay at home. That would be cruel. Our report is right on. I applaud the authors of it. I endorse it. What we're proposing is a new and smarter and different system that says to people, we're not going to any longer have a welfare system for life. We're going to ask you to get a job. We're going to help you get a job. And when you get a job, we're going to change the rules so that you join in the prosperity that every Vermonter who also has a job gets to enjoy. We're not taking away your child care benefits. We're not going to reduce your housing benefit. We're not going to punish you for going to work. When you impose the cap as of October, I believe, you're going to have a lot of people who are going to run out of benefits right at that point. Uh, wouldn't it be fairer or more compassionate to, to uh, you know, put off the, uh, the imposition of that cap? I think the fairest thing we can do is take a system that locks you in poverty, that locks you in welfare, that doesn't allow you to go out and have a pr professional career when you want to put your kids in good quality child care, is the cruelest system we could have. And the faster we can move from that, the more compassionate we'll be. What would you say to those who don't feel like it's a program that's locking them into poverty, but it's the, the current economy in the state? And but that, you know, this is what, program. you know, I've heard the argument, and this is what I say to that. Listen, let's celebrate the fact that in the last two years, we've seen a sea change in Vermont's economic outlook. We really have. I know it's still tough. We're coming out of the worst recession in American history. But here's the evidence. Here are the facts. Vermont has the lowest unemployment rate this side of the Mississippi. We have the fastest growth rate of any New England states, including that place that I look at from my farm to our east, who brags about economic development. It's not as high as ours, the state of New Hampshire. We are the only state that saw income growth in 2011. Now, it was only 4%, but guess what? That was 4% better than the rest of America that's been facing stagnant wages. My point is, if you talk to the employers, they've got jobs. I sat next to Janet Bombardier from IBM at dinner the other night, and she said, we can't get qualified people to do our entry-level jobs. We're not now talking about the two-year degree. Our entry-level jobs is the first time in the history of IBM Essex that we haven't been able to have a queue of people who are here to do our work. We've got jobs. We've got jobs. We need to change the system that is putting barriers in the way of people who want to work. And that's what our current welfare system is doing. Question about the uh, last semester um, part of the plan that you talked about. Is that, is that just for Vermonters? Or what happens if someone comes from Massachusetts, attends the University of Vermont, and then decides to stay and work? We'll take them. <laughs> we'll take them. You just heard the 50,000 students that are coming in here to get the best education they possibly could. We want to keep them. If I asked people to raise their hands here of how many of them didn't grow up here but came here because of education, just raise your hands. Look at that. We want to keep more of them. Even my secretary of administration will keep him. Governor, uh, several uh, single moms just spoke at a news conference a little while ago this morning you know, talking about the reach up uh, changes and uh, they were saying that several barriers to getting into the workforce and one of them including transportation um, and you know obviously child care and many other things but transportation came up repeatedly what, what, what can we do to as we change this program and impose these time limits to make it work better uh, listen this is what I can tell you uh, you're not going to find a governor or an administration or a secretary of the agency of human human resources in the form of Doug Racine or commissioners in the form of David Iacoboni and others or secretary of education uh, who are more committed more committed to being a compassionate state with a heart that helps to ensure that everybody has economic opportunity when I hear some of the testimony or read about it in the press I keep going hey she just made my point when do you 
Thank she you. just made my point. They're not paying for childcare, so we can't get a job. They're not providing or ensuring we can get transportation. We will work with every current reach up recipient to get rid of the obstacles of prosperity. It's, this is a basic issue of human dignity. We have a system that locks you, traps you. There isn't a progressive, a, a Democrat, a Republican, an independent, or a person with a heart on this Valentine's Day who can look me in the eye and say, you got a great system now. It locks people in poverty, and if you get a job, you get punished. That is not the Vermont way. What do you think of the bill the Senate passed yesterday on end of life? Have they passed it? Well, you know, that they voted for support yesterday. You know, uh, I, I want to start by saying that I know that there's a divergence of opinion on this bill. And I am a strong proponent of the bill. And I just want to tell you the reason why. I hadn't thought about this bill much until I was running for governor, and I was having one of my many conversations with Vermonters, and I was going into, an, in a Democratic primary, uh, one of the many primary discussions that we had, debates, whatever you want to call it. We had over 60, and I can't remember which one this was, but it was in Ludlow, Vermont. And a woman came up to me and said, uh, Governor, where do you stand on, on uh, end-of-life choices? And I said, why do you ask? And she said, I ask because this is an issue that I care about deeply. I'm not usually a single issue voter, but this one really matters to me. I've got ovarian cancer. It's one of the most painful ways that you can die. I have outlived my life expectancy by my doctors at Dartmouth by two years now, and I'm going to continue to beat their odds for the simple reason that I love being on this earth, I love my grandkids, I love Vermont, but most importantly, I'm the caregiver for my husband who has stage four Parkinson's. And when I go, he's got to go into a home, which is his biggest nightmare. So I'm asking you to not, in my last 10 or 12 or 14 days of life, when I'm suffering from extraordinary pain, I'm asking you not to tell me how to spend those last days. And I won't. Now, the bill that the Senate first discussed accomplishes those goals. It's very carefully crafted. It follows the Oregon model and close to the Washington model. It's not reinventing a wheel. I think when you pass an amendment that's not thought out, that's written on the fly, that you're going to get under unintended consequences that don't put the protections in place that Vermonters feel strongly about in this transition to a new system. So I support the bill as it was originally introduced. I'm hopeful that the Senate will send it over to the House so that the Speaker and the sensible House can put it back in shape. So that's what you'd advise is they just get it over with, pass it along as it is? As it I, I want to see the bill come to my desk, and I think the best likelihood for it to come to my desk in a smarter and more compassionate and more thoughtful form would be to let the House take a little work at it. Governor, there's a proposal to uh, purchase a new state airplane. Is your administration part of that discussion? Oh. Well, you know, let's talk about the airplane. Uh, we right now are operating a, a airplane that's 50 some years old. And uh, we need an airplane for two reasons. The first is it's required to undertake the work that's required of the Agency of Natural Resources to air surveillance, which they do a lot of. And it's also necessary to operate our, for our aviation program, we operate a lot of airports. So we, at least, we need at least one rig that flies. Now, uh, I've used that plane from time to time. And, uh, you know, I don't have the fear gene, so I'm all right. Last time I was in it, the door flew open. I pulled it back, <laughs> wanted to see what the gas tank was reading, and so we knocked the, the uh, gauge a few times, and we couldn't get it to read. Now, I've got confidence that we filled it up before we left. All I can tell you is, at some point, at some point, we're going to have to confront the fact that we've got a 50-year-old plane, that the doors fly open when you fly it, that the gas gauge doesn't work and the rest. My staff flips out every time I crawl into it. I, you know, I have confidence in the airplane, and we don't have to do it this year, but at some point we're going to have to deal with it, and that's, I think, what the agency transportation suggested. This is probably not the year, but we will have to deal with it going forward. We, we, need, we need a plane that flies. Can you explain the whole flip the door flying open? Was this in air? Yeah. 
Tell us more. <laughs> this, I, I, this, this I, not I was not. Announcement out of the water. I just want to make clear that. Were you wearing a seatbelt? I did have a seatbelt. You were fully dressed? I, <laughs> I was not hunting for bears. <laughs> or drinking so this um, is not the year you're conceding that this, this is not the year? Listen, I don't much. I, this is not, listen, I got a lot of things to get through this building this year. This is not one of them. So does that mean you're withdrawing the request or you're just not going to push for it? No, you know, team, I'm running a $5 billion budget. We employ 7,000 plus people. Uh, I, I'm not on top of every line item that gets introduced, to be honest with you, in terms of exactly what it all means. I can tell you this. I don't think either myself or the secretary believe that this has to happen this year. At some point, Vermont's going to have to face the fact that we're flying a pretty old airplane. It was made in 1962, I believe, wasn't it? 62. And, you know, it would be good to have a plane where the doors don't fly open midair and where the gas gauge actually gives you some reading on how much fuel you got left. I mean, well, it doesn't seem like an unreasonable request. One of the questions is, should the state rent or buy? What do you think about that? You know, I'll let the transportation folks do the math on that, but I can tell you that Based upon what I read in the press, they did the math and they found that it's more economical to pursue it as they proposed in the budget. But listen, the, wor the world is not going to rise and fall on our old airplane. We'll keep flying it. I'll keep flying in it when I need to, and we're all going to be all right. When do you fly in it, and do you ever use it to go out of state and that kind of thing? Or do you want to? I'm not sure it would get there. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what's the occasion that? No, I've never used out of state. Uh, the only time I've used the plane, uh, and you know, some governors have dared to use it and some governors haven't. I do know that my friend Brian Doobie used to use it as lieutenant governor, uh, but he probably is better at landing planes that don't, planes that don't have an engine than most of us. <laughs> but uh, this, is, this is what, this is, I've used it as an example. I'll give you an example. When uh, we were clipping the ribbon on the new bypass in Bennington, Vermont, it was a big deal. We've been at it for, what, 10, 12, 20 years talking about it. We finally did it. So I went down, I flew down for that because I had to be at another engagement, the other side of the state, and I couldn't get there if I didn't fly it. It gets better mileage than my SUV, uh, so if you can keep the doors closed and figure out how much fuel's in it, it's actually a pretty good deal for taxpayers. Is that when the door flew open? I can't remember, to be honest. Governor, I want to go back to education costs real quick. I think the budget for this year rose by about, I know that's what everyone's here for, so I figure we'd focus on that, by about 5%. And the House and Ways uh, Means Committee recently passed a bill that would raise property taxes in order to cover that. Is that something that Vermonters are going to continue to see their taxes going up to cover educational costs? Vermonters decide how much we spend on education every year when they go to their town meeting or vote on their school budget. So we decide town by town, community by community. I'm a big believer in local control. If Vermonters want to reduce their school spending, they need to vote on it. This Montpelier doesn't make those decisions. Those decisions are made locally, community by community. So you've essentially uh, answered this, but um, just to be very specific, the progressives offered up this menu of uh, $50 million worth of um, revenue ideas they have. Um, I know that you are very committed to the entirety of the package you presented. Um, are you saying that you would not consider supporting any of those? You're very much committed to the EITC funding proposal? You know, in fairness, I haven't seen the proposal, so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't, I mean, yeah, I could read it now, but I'll spare you. But here's the point. You know where I stand. Uh, I feel very strongly that we have the existing resources right now to deliver on my plan to make us the best education system in the country. We don't need more money. We need to spend it more wisely, and that's exactly what we've proposed. What's your position on the uh, lawmaker proposal for or, you know, a gas tax and a you know, sizable increase in property taxes? You promised well, no yeah. broad-based broad -based taxes. But you're, yeah, let's go back to the property tax. Just want to repeat. Local communities decide how much we're going to spend on schools. By statute, we then need to set the statewide property tax rate. So I don't have control, nor do the legislators in this building, over that rate. That is set and determined by our local communities. And i got to say, our school boards over the last three or four years have done an excellent job of holding the lid on spending at a time when they faced real challenges. So, you know, this year isn't as low as we'd like, but they have been headed in the right direction. They're working hard, and I think they're doing a good job. What was the second part of that? Gas tax. Oh, the gas tax. You know, we've been pretty clear on that. Uh, this, the Legislative Study Committee uh, came up with a number of options to ensure that we 
stop the leak from the bucket. This isn't talking about new programs. It's not talking about new taxes. It's a result of our success in driving more fuel-efficient cars and reducing the miles that we're travel, traveling. So that's the good news. The bad news is our current tax structure is structured in such a way that when we reduce our gallonage by 36 million gallons, which is what we're burning, we're burning 36 million gallons, is that right? Less than we were just a few years ago. That means that we are not taking in the revenue we once were. So the Legislative Study Committee came up with a number of proposals to help repair the leaking bucket. Uh, I am happy with any of the proposals that they come up with or a mix of the proposals that they come up with and we're going to work together with them to come up with a smart solution. What's the result if we fail? If we fail to patch the leaks in the bucket, what's the result? We will send $40 million just this year alone back to Washington, D.C. in federal transportation money that we desperately need to rebuild our crumbling roads and bridges. So it's a choice. But is it, would you say though that's a broad-based tax then? I would say that we're uh, re-grabbing, I would say that we are re-focusing and re, uh, we're finding a better way to take in transportation dollars that we've been losing over the last several years because we're driving less miles. But it's you can call you can call it whatever you want. Of course, it's affecting all Vermonters. Do any of us want to do it? No. But do Vermonters want us to spend and send $40 million back to Washington, D.C. in transportation money, cancel paving projects, cancel bridge projects at a time where it's often hard to get here, there from here? I don't think they want that either. So it's tough choice time. That's why we get elected. And we'll come up with a sensible solution. How much money were you able to help raise in Miami for the Northeast Kingdom project? I don't know that because you, uh, you should really call up Bill Stenger and, and uh, ask them how successful they were. All I can tell you is it seemed to me to be a very successful trip. Um, you know, I feel very, very strongly about helping them to raise the $600 million to grow 10,000 new jobs in the Northeast Kingdom. I want to do that all through Vermont. But the fact that we're growing jobs in the area of the state that has chronically suffered from high unemployment is a huge deal. So I'll do whatever I have to do. I'll travel where I have to travel to help them raise the the loot, and I think we'll do it. And you're comfortable spending as much time out of state as you are planning to do going to Brazil and then to China. You're spending a lot of time down in D.C. for the DGA as well. Um, do you feel like at a certain point you might be spending too much time out of state? I don't know. From the sound of legislators around here, they just assume I get out of here more often. <laughs> did, you, did you stay in state specifically because the Senate was voting on this debt bill? Did you change your plans because of the, the Senate's schedule? No. Gonna go no, I was going to have a, I, I, it, there was a White House meeting that was scheduled that got delayed, so that's why I didn't go to Washington. Does the fact that Mr. Stanger asked you to go indicate that he's having some trouble raising enough money? Absolutely not. And I just want to repeat, this isn't a new thing. I went last year on a trip to Miami, same city, same state, uh, to raise money for the existing $250 million worth of projects that they had going there. So this isn't a new thing for me. I'm just going to do more of it. And I want to be clear. Uh, I am offering my services to other EB-5 projects. Uh, there's p huge potential to raise the biggest. One of our big challenges in growing jobs in Vermont is capital. And if you talk to any entrepreneur or any business person, you know, they'll say our big challenge is coming up with a loop for our good ideas. Now, Vermont is doing a better job of harnessing the EB-5 money than any other state in the country. That's because St. Patrick Leahy invented the program. We're the only state that our entire state is the EB-5 region. And we've got a huge opportunity here to grab smart dollars to help grow jobs in Vermont. And as you know, what's my singular focus? Jobs and prosperity. So this is a great way to get there. So I'll travel, you know, as much as I need to to do it. I will not use that old Cessna to get there, to Brazil. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much. Sorry to hold all you people hostage, but it's been a while since we